captivity narratives are usually stories of people captured by enemies whom they consider uncivilized, or whose beliefs and customs they oppose. The best-known captivity narratives are those concerning the indigenous peoples of North America. These narratives have an enduring place in literature, history, ethnography, and the study of native peoples. However, captivity narratives have also come to play a major role in the study of contemporary religious movements. Thanks to scholars of religion like David G. Bromley and James R. Lewis, in this article, both main types of captivity narratives are considered. Traditionally, historians have made limited use of certain captivity narratives. They have regarded the genre with suspicion because of its ideological underpinnings. As a result of new scholarly approaches, historians with a more certain grasp of Native American cultures are distinguishing between plausible statements of fact and value-laden judgments. In order to study the narratives as rare sources from inside Native societies, contemporary historians such as Linda Colley and anthropologists such as Pauline Turner Strong have also found the narratives useful in analyzing how the colonists constructed the other, as well as what the narratives reveal about the settlers' sense of themselves and their culture, and the experience of crossing the line to another. Collie has studied the long history of English captivity in other cultures, both the Barbary pirate captives who preceded those in North America, and British captives in cultures such as India after the North American experience. Certain North American captivity narratives involving native peoples were published from the 18th through the 19th centuries but they reflected a well-established genre in English literature. There had already been English accounts of captivity by Barbary pirates, or in the Middle East, which established some of the major elements of the form, following the American experience. Additional accounts were written after British people were captured during exploration and settlement in India and East Asia. Other types of captivity narratives, such as those recounted by apostates from religious movements, have remained an enduring feature of modern media, and currently appear in books, periodicals, film, and television. The unifying factor in most captivity narratives, whether they stem from geopolitical or religious conflicts, is that the captive portrays the captor's way of life as alien, undesirable, and incompatible with the captive's own culture. This underscores the utility of captivity narratives in garnering support for social control measures, such as removing Native Americans to reservations or stigmatizing participation in religious movements, whether Catholicism in the 19th century or ISKCON in the 20th. Captivity narratives tend to be culturally chauvinistic, viewing an alien culture through the lens of the narrator's preferred culture, thus making value judgments like Puritans good, Indians bad, background. Because of the competition between New France and New England in North America, Colonists in New England were frequently taken captive by Canadians and their Indian allies. According to Catherine Dirunian Stardala, statistics on the number of captives taken from the 15th through the 19th centuries are imprecise and unreliable, since record-keeping was not consistent and the fate of hostages who disappeared or died was often not known. Yet conservative estimates run into the thousands, and a more realistic figure may well be higher. For some statistical perspective, however, between King Philip's War and the last of the French and Indian Wars, approximately 1,641 New Englanders were taken hostage. During the decades-long struggle between whites and Plains Indians in the mid-19th century, hundreds of women and children were captured. Many narratives included a theme of redemption by faith in the face of the threats and temptations of an alien way of life. Barbary captivity narratives, accounts of English people captured and held by Barbary pirates, were popular in England in the 16th and 17th centuries. The first Barbary captivity narrative by a resident of North America was that of Abraham Brown. The most popular was that of Captain James Riley, entitled An Authentic Narrative of the Loss of the Brig Commerce. 
Jonathan Dickinson's journal, God's Protecting Providence, an account by a Quaker of shipwreck survivors captured by Indians in Florida who survived by placing their trust in God to protect them, has been described by the Cambridge History of English and American Literature as, in many respects, the best of all the captivity tracts, and Eliza Bleaker's epistolary novel, The History of Maria Kittle, is considered the first known captivity novel. It set the form for subsequent Indian capture novels. New England, American Indian captivity narratives, accounts of men and women of European descent who were captured by Native Americans, were popular in both America and Europe from the 17th century until the close of the United States frontier late in the 19th century. Mary Rowlandson's memoir, A Narrative of the Captivity and Restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, is a classic example of the genre. According to Nancy Armstrong and Leonard Tenenhouse, Rowlandson's captivity narrative was one of the most popular captivity narratives on both sides of the Atlantic, although the text temporarily fell out of print after 1720. It experienced a revival in the 1780s. Other popular captivity narratives from the late 17th century include Cotton Mather's The Captivity of Hannah Dustin, a famous captivity narrative set during King William's War, and Jonathan Dickinson's God's Protecting Providence. American captivity narratives were usually based on true events, but they frequently contained fictional elements as well. Some were entirely fictional, created because the stories were popular. One spurious captivity narrative was The Remarkable Adventures of Jackson Johannet of Massachusetts. Captivity in another culture brought into question many aspects of the captives' lives, reflecting their religious beliefs. The Puritans tended to write narratives that negatively characterized Indians. They portrayed the trial of events as a warning from God concerning the state of the Puritans' souls, and concluded that God was the only hope for redemption. During Queen Anne's War, after the raid on Deerfield in 1704, in which many people in the town were killed and more than 100 people were taken captive, forced overland to Montreal and held in Canada for an extended period, the minister John Williams wrote a captivity narrative about his experiences titled The Unredeemed Captive. Published in 1707, the work was widely distributed in the 18th and 19th centuries and continues to be published today. Due to his account, as well as the high number of captives, this raid, unlike others of the time, was remembered and became an element in the American frontier story. During Father Rail's War, Indians raided Dover, New Hampshire and Elizabeth Hansen wrote her captivity narrative. Captivity narratives experienced a revival in the final 30 years of the 18th century. Tales such as A Narrative of the Capture and Treatment of John Dodge by the English at Detroit, a surprising account of the captivity and escape of Philip M. Donald and Alexander Maliode of Virginia from the Chickamauga Indians. Abraham Panther's A Very Surprising Narrative of a Young Woman Who Was Discovered in a Rocky Cave Narrative of the Remarkable Occurrences in the life of John Blatchford of Capan, and a narrative of the captivity and sufferings of Mr. Ebenezer Fletcher of New Ipswich, who was taken prisoner by the British provided American reading audiences with new narratives, some of which featured English soldiers as the primary antagonists. Susanna Willard Johnson of New Hampshire wrote about her captivity during the French and Indian War, Nova Scotia, and Acadia. Seven captivity narratives are known that were written as a result of New Englanders being captured by the MIKMAQ and Maliseet tribes in Nova Scotia, and Acadia, and L.T. John Hamilton at the Siege of Grand Prix. Whether their captivity experiences were documented is unknown. The most famous was by John Giles, who wrote memoirs of odd adventures, strange deliverances, and C. In the captivity of John Giles, E.S.Q., commander of the garrison on St. 
George's River. He was captured in the Siege of Pemaquid and wrote about his torture by the natives at Maductic Village during King William's War. His memoirs are regarded as a precursor to the frontier romances of James Fenimore Cooper, William Gilmore Sims, and Robert Montgomery Bird. New England merchant William Potter was captured during the siege of Annapolis Royal during King George's War and wrote about his captivity. Among other things, Potter also wrote about being tortured. Another captivity narrative was written by Henri Grace was taken captive by the MIKMAQ near Fort Cumberland during Father Lalauta's war. The narrative was entitled, The History of the Life and Sufferings of Henry Grace. The fourth captivity narrative by John Paisant recounts his being taken prisoner with his mother and sister in the Malice to me back, quote, KMAQ raid on Lunenburg during the French and Indian War. After four years of captivity, his sister decided to remain with the natives, while he and his mother returned to Nova Scotia. Anthony Castile was taken in the attack at Jeddel during Father Lalauta's war and recorded his experience. John with a spoon was captured at Annapolis Royal during the French and Indian War and wrote about his experience. During the war Gamaliel Smethurst also recorded his captivity and published it before he died. There are also the narratives of L.T. Simon Stevens of John Stark's Ranger Company and Captain Robert Stobo who escaped together from Quebec along the coast of Acadia before reaching British-occupied Louisbourg. During the Petit Kodiak River campaign, the Acadian militia took prisoner William Caesar McCormick of William Stark's Rangers and his detachment of three Rangers and two light infantry, privates from the 35th. The Acadian militia took the prisoners to Miramachi and then Restigoche. In August 1758, William Merritt was taken captive close to St. George and then taken to the St. John River and later on to Quebec. North Africa. North America was not the only region to produce captivity narratives. North African slave narratives were written by white Europeans and Americans who were captured, often as a result of shipwrecks, and enslaved in North Africa in the 18th and early 19th centuries. If the Europeans converted to Islam and adopted North Africa as their home, they could often end their slavery status but such actions disqualified them from being ransomed to freedom by European consuls in Africa, who were qualified only to free captives who had remained Christian. About 20,000 British and Irish captives were held in North Africa from the beginning of the 17th century to the middle of the 18th, and roughly 700 Americans were held captive as North African slaves between 1785 and 1815. The British captives produce 15 full biographical accounts of their experiences, and the American captives produce more than 100 editions of 40 full-length narratives, assimilated captives. In his book Beyond Geography, The Western Spirit Against the Wilderness, Frederick W. Turner discusses the effect of those accounts in which white captives came to prefer and eventually adopt a Native American way of life. They challenged European-American assumptions about the superiority of their culture. During some occasions of prisoner exchanges, the white captives had to be forced to return to their original cultures. Children who had assimilated to new families found it extremely painful to be torn from them after several years' captivity. Numerous adult and young captives who had assimilated chose to stay with the American Indians and never returned to live in Anglo-American or European communities. The story of Mary Jemison, who was captured as a young girl and spent the remainder of her 90 years among the Seneca, is such an example. It is uncertain to what extent captives who preferred to remain with their captors were acting on their own free will or were under the effects of Stockholm Syndrome or traumatic bonding, defined as the strong emotional attachment between an abused person and his or her abuser formed as a result of the cycle of violence. At the same time, we should recognize the temptation to explain away in psychological terms what may have been genuine love for adoptive parents or native culture. 
Where the Spirit Lives, a 1989 film written by Keith Lecky and directed by Bruce Pittman turns the tables on the familiar white captive Aboriginal captors narrative. It sensitively portrays the plight of young Canadian Aborigines who were captured and sent to residential schools, where they were stripped of their native identity and forced to conform to Eurocentric customs and beliefs. The story of Patty Hearst, which unfolded primarily in the mid-1970s, represents a special case. She was initially captured by a domestic U.S. terror group called the Symbionese Liberation Army in February 1974. About a year later, she was photographed wielding a machine gun, helping them rob a bank. Was she an assimilated captive, or was she only cooperating as a matter of survival? Was she brainwashed, or fully conscious, acting with free will? These questions were hotly debated at the time political and social ramifications. Captivity narratives arise from border skirmishes between peoples and cultures in conflict, and may take on an air of triumphalism, e.g., having escaped from the enemy. I'm here to tell you in this time of trouble that we are right and they are wrong. In typical captivity narratives concerning Native Americans, the rescued white narrator portrays her captors as savage and inferior, but in tales written by assimilated captives, the Native American way of life may be portrayed as noble and superior. Captivity narratives are often at the heart of contested views about peoples and cultures. They can serve a political or social control function by reinforcing negative stereotypes and justifying aggressive actions taken against a targeted group, with the rationale that such actions are meant to civilize or liberate them. For instance, in People v. Woody, the state of California sought to uphold the conviction of members of the Native American Church for sacramental use of peyote. However, in overturning that conviction, the California Supreme Court wrote, the Attorney General argues that since peyote could be regarded as a symbol, one that obstructs enlightenment and shackles the Indian to primitive conditions, the responsibility rests with the state to eliminate its use.